Any questions before I start? Anything pop into your heads? Nothing. Well, yeah. I have one. I can't quite figure out how to say it. That's the offertory. Right. And why do we why do we stand and sit right away? I don't understand why we're standing. Is it because he's turning to us? Well, yeah, it has to do with it because you're being asked to pray. It's uh it is a bit strange. Yeah. It's just um really everybody should stand. It's the thing is you got those red books and they say a certain way to do it. There's different ways. I don't understand the way the red book red books say it, but normally when the, the priest is probably sitting at the chair because the, the creed just took place. But when he stands, everybody should stand. So they should already be standing when this is Oremus. But then after that, they can sit down because there's nothing to be done. The, the prayer's already done. So they can sit down again because there, there is no actual Oremus. There's no prayer to be said. So now we'll go into some of the prayers that are actually being said there. I know this is a bit much because there's it's difficult to talk about this. It's a simple thing. The offertory has essentially like three, four prayers that are happening, an incensation of the altar, a washing of hands. It's a simple thing. But there's, you got the history of it, you got the liturgical things that are happening, you got the prayers themselves that are significant, and so you got to bounce around a little bit. And then you got the problems over 2,000 years with bread and wine and all those things that were happening. So the first prayer that we say, so that the bread is brought to the altar, and that's done by, usually the server just brings that over, brings it straight up, and that's the Roman way. Just to directly put it on the altar, and then it's immediately offered. The way this is done in the Roman rite, <coughs> now we're going to talk about the historically the way it was done when you have a deacon, and a, uh, a priest deacon, and a subdeacon. But the chalice is brought up, and the chalice is obviously covered. Everything that is consecrated would be covered, protected from the... Um, From the vault, not vulgar glances, but the, uh, I don't know, like the vain glances of the people. So the, the people, the, the, the lay faithful, it's not that they're, they're dirty and impure and things, but their eyes are out in the world. And they spend their time looking at things that are out in the world. And out in the world is all the, uh, you know, worldly stuff. So the consecrated things are always veiled from their gaze. It's not to say that they're, they're out there doing what they have to do, and they have graces for that, especially with the confirmation graces for, to help uh, the lay faithful who are out in the world to be able to, to overcome the world while being out there, and not to be of the world while they're in the world. But because of that, too, um, all these things are veiled. The chalice is brought up, and on it has a patent, and on that patent there's a, a piece of bread, the ostia magna, the Ostia Magna is the big host that the priest uses. And then there might be a ciborium with other hosts in it that would be offered. Now, the deacon takes that off, that patent off, and he hands it sideways to the priest. He first kisses the patent. He always kisses everything that he hands to the priest. He kisses that. He hands it to the priest this way, and the priest takes it with his hands this way, not touching above it, and offers it upward. He makes a glance to, remember, we're entering now into certain prayers where... They also have actions connected to the prayer, and the actions that are, that are taking place are either, especially what we'll see like in consecration, they're using their eyes the way our Lord used his eyes. They're looking where our Lord looked. They're acting like our Lord. And here there's, there's a part of that as well, but there's other significance to some of these prayers. So he takes the bread, he offers it up about to his eyes, and then he lowers it about to chin level, looks up to heaven, and then humbly looks back down saying this first prayer, the sushi pe santi pater omnipotens, receive, Holy Father, ho Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, the spotless host. Remember, anything that's offered in sacrifice, though it's our Lord that will be sacrificed or entering into the sacrifice, he makes himself, he makes himself, his sacrifice present in this host or will, has to be pure and spotless. Remember, it has to be the best of the best. Something that's unblemished has to be offered to God. Now we're offering a host that will be used in this sacrificial representation uh, as the pure host, the 
Ostia Immaculate, the Immaculate Host. To be a spotless host, which I, thine unworthy servant, so this is why he looks back down. He doesn't keep his eyes lifted up to heaven. He looks back down because he's humbly saying, I, thy unworthy servant, offer unto thee for the living, for my, for my living and true, sorry, for my living and true God, and for my countless sins, trespasses, and omissions, likewise for all those here present, and for all the faithful Christians, whether living or dead. So first he offers Mass for himself, then for all the people present, then for all the Christians living and dead. Now when he brings that host back down, he takes it down right above the corporal. Now this is a big distinction between the extraordinary form and the ordinary form. The, what the Mass has always done and what they've done for the last 40, 50 years. They bring the patent down right over the, the corporal, which is that other linen with a cross on it. He makes a sign of the cross very low and close to the corporal. Sign of the cross with it. He slides the host off of the patent and he just pushes the patent out there. Uh, that's going to be now taken away somewhere else. Or at a low mass, he puts it halfway under the corporal and covers the other half so it's hidden for the rest of mass. Now why? It seems a lot of priests, when they started to learn the extraordinary form of the mass again, after only knowing the ordinary form of the mass, they thought it was disrespectful to leave the host lying on the corporal. And in fact, it seems so, because we're used to it laying on a, on a plate. However, I'd like to draw your attention to, in the old sacrifices of the Jews, when grain offerings were offered, they were offered on a plate. Interesting. Now, through the ordinary form of the Mass, we leave our Lord on a plate. I don't know why we do it. I, I've not seen why, they, why they've chosen to do that from the, the liturgical commission that was formed. Maybe it's, I'm not sure why. But the corporal itself is consecrated so that, because it's going to touch our, our Lord. Now, when the deacon... It, it's solemn mass during the creed. He takes the burst. The burst is what holds the, the corporal and it's folded up. When he takes that, he, there's a moment right after the et incarnatus est. He walks over to the, the credence table. He takes the burst. He opens it. And he holds it in front of his eyes. And he, he does it so he, he keeps his eyes focused on things that are pure. And he walks that. He walks all the way to the altar with the thing before his eyes, looking at the corporal. Genuflex goes up and he sets it up there. He sets it up on the altar. Now this corporal will hold the patent. Uh, I'm sorry, will hold the host for the rest of the mass. And the host will be laying on the corporal, which is laying over top of three other altar linens, which is directly over top of the relic inside the consecrated altar, which has a cross on it. And our Lord will be laying right on that cross. The point is that in all of his humility, our Lord again lays on the cross in this sacrifice. So that prayer being said, he takes that, he makes that sign of the cross, the sign of the cross always being used, slides it off the patent and lays it out to the side. If it's a solemn mass, the subdeacon here in a minute will take that with a humeral veil that's over his shoulders and he'll cover, he'll c cover it. So he co covers it from the, the, the vein looks from the, the people. And he, he covers his face, his own face with it for the blindness of the Jews is what a lot of spiritual authors talk about. Or the, I shouldn't say blindness of the Jews. I mean the blindness of the, oh, like the Old Testament. They, they didn't have the fullness revealed to them yet. After this action, the deacon turns and receives from the subdeacon wine and he pours wine in and the priest looks and nods when he's ready for how much wine he wants in there. Now, there should be enough wine that the water that gets poured in doesn't um, lessen the quality of the substance of the wine, right? And then the subdeacon will turn and he'll say, Benedici de Pater Reverende, and the, the priest will make sign of the cross, and he'll, he'll pray the prayer that I, I'd read to you before, that prayer that used to be a collect, uh, ancient collect, from uh, meaning a, the first prayer that's said in Mass from Christmas time, talking about the, the incarnation, the, the divine and the the incarnation of our Lord in, the, in the humanity. So the act of the offering, so after that the wine is then 
the deacon makes sure there's no drops on the outside of the chalice because you don't it's uh, it lacks decorum if you're going to consecrate drops of water or drops of wine so they make sure that all the fluid that is inside the chalice is all now united right and if they're not they wipe them out with the with the corporal and lay that corporal down on the altar and then he takes the chalice kisses it hands it to the priest and kisses the hand the priest's hand he holds it up at eye level as he looks up to the cross and the deacon who was his job before to always distribute and take care of things that had to do with the substance of the, the precious blood and you even have that in the instance of saint lawrence of rome the one they put on a grill and he said you know turn me over i'm done on this side uh, he reminded the Pope that it was his job to take care of the precious blood. And that's a famous instance that happened with St. Lawrence. Here what we have is the, the deacon. He assists by holding the bottom of the chalice. And he recites the same prayer, the Offerimus Tibi. And I'll read you the Offerimus Tibi. We offer unto thee, O Lord, the chalice of salvation, beseeching thy, thy clemency, that it may ascend as a sweet odor before thy divine majesty for our own salvation and that of the whole world. These are beautiful prayers. These, are, the, these two are both directed to the Father. These offerings are always made to God the Father. Obviously, because sacrifice is offered to God the Father. After that, he takes the chalice down. He makes another sign of the cross over top of the corporal. He lays it down, and then that's covered with a pall, a pall, a white little, it's like a small little hard corporal. Before, they had a big corporal that was pulled up over top of the chalice at this point, and that corporal came up and just covered everything. So you can see how they eliminated that over time because it'd be cumbersome and difficult to deal with. So the self-offering of the priest and the faithful. So this is the next prayer. Right after he does that, they cover the chalice, and there's this very beautiful prayer called Inumilitatis. The priest takes his hands together, and he lays them on the altar, and he bows down low over top of the altar, and he says this beautiful prayer. I'll read it to you. Humbly in mind and contrite in heart, may we, he says, may we, because the, the deacon also in assisting there with the assisting with the chalice, he's also representing the people. And so here you have the priest saying, remember that chalice is offered for our salvation, is what the other prayer said. So here we're asking humbly before God by bowing down over top of the altar, and the priest is interceding also for us. May we find favor with thee, O Lord, and may the sacrifice we this day offer up be well-pleasing to thee. Thou art our Lord and God. This is how at the, at the Offertory of Mass, it is true right before the Offertory or during it, we do contribute money. But after you contribute that money, remember that's an external sign of an internal uh, desire of wanting to, to offer something. Here's where we unite ourselves. Now this chalice that's being offered, this bread that's being offered, it all talks about for our salvation, in reparation for our sins, in making, um, making reparations against offenses we made against God. This is, this is what's to dispose us during this time in the offertory. And the priest is there doing all of this, and he's even saying we, so that means we're there to be uniting ourselves to his prayers. Now, the next prayer, okay, so this, a, a good way to reflect on this is this prayer itself, in humilitatis, in spiritu humilitatis, that humble, humbly in mind, this is a prayer of the three young men in the furnace in Babylon. The furnace in Babylon. You remember the furnace in Babylon? The three young the youth got thrown in there? Well, they had a complete and utter trust in God. And if their sacrifice was going to be pleasing to God for the good of their people in Babylon, then they were willing to take it. Humbly, they were willing to take it. That's the disposition we're to have at Mass. Whatever you want of me, I'll accept anything. Even if you want me to be on the cross, I'll accept anything. Magnificent. To unite ourselves to this prayer. We need to under these are prayers to be reflected on deeply. But to know at Mass, if we really want our Lord to be on that cross again, 
or at least to have that cross represented, we know it's because we need to be there with him. And as a Christian, more than just making reparation for our own sins, we need to learn how to not to sin and start making reparation for others. And that's what this prayer helps us with as well. It's to, it's to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God. So the offering that the priest is making becomes our own. Now the invocation, the, epic, uh, the uh, epiclesis, um, there's controversy here. Controversy arises with the epiclesis. Controversy. Now, the Veni, so right after this prayer, so the priest is bowed down over the altar with his hands on the altar, and he's saying very profoundly, very humbly, this prayer, in spiritu militatis, and then he looks up to heaven. It's a, it's a powerful moment. He looks up to heaven with great boldness because the first time he's looking really directly up. The other times he's looking at the cross. Now he's looking directly up to heaven, which means he's taking a great confidence after this act of humility before God. He has confidence. This is the act of hope. This is that has to do with the virtue of hope. He's able to look directly up to God, raise his hands up. This is an invocation. Raise his hands up to God. And then he bows back down very profoundly and he says, Come thou, the sanctifier, God almighty and everlasting. And then he blesses, bless this sacrifice, which is, which is prepared for the, for, thy, for the glory and thy holy name. It's a very beautiful and powerful, um, powerful prayer. However, so it is an invocation. And we call this the, the, the epiclesis that happens in the Roman rite. Now, in the ordinary form of the Mass, we think that the epiclesis is at the quam oblationum. Now, all liturgists before Vatican II all insist that the quam oblationum is not an epiclesis. It's a false epiclesis because there's no invocation. It has elements that seems like an invocation. So it's not an invocation. But now the church tells us that's the epiclesis. I don't know what to think about it. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying before they said it wasn't. So don't say, Friar Anthony said in the, old, in the New Mass, there is no epiclesis. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you what people said before. Also, this idea that, that, our hand, that the priest's hands now becomes a dove that comes down. I've seen priests do or consecrations where they have the dove, the dove come down. This did not mean that ever in the, in the history of the church. Well, at least not in the Roman rite. Hands being like this, it looks like a bird. I guess it looks like a bird, but it's not supposed to be a bird. The hands are just crossed there and your hands are together. I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again probably next week or the week after that when we talk about the Ankigitur, which is the prayer that happens before the Quam Oblationum. The Ankigitur is the place in the, in the extraordinary form of the Mass where you put your hands out over the oblation. It symbolized not communicating anything that comes from the Holy Ghost, but rather our sin. It was putting your hands on the scapegoat before the scapegoat was let out that it would take our sins away from the, the family of Israel. Does that make sense? And they'd actually place their hands around the center of the chalice and just right above the, the, the pall, just right there in the center. I'd see one holy priest, he used to always press right on the center of the pall, right when he'd be saying these words, because it had to do with the fact that he knew he was transmitting the sins of the people or trying to onto the, the sacrificial elements so that they would wipe away our sins. So the Veni Santificatur, where he looks up to heaven, it's an invo invocation, Fortescue says is not an epiclesis. He says because an epiclesis in the Roman rite has been lost. He says the, actually the Roman rite does not have an epiclesis. Now, you have one liturgist says they do. You have another one. Fortescue's a pretty sharp guy, but so is Nicholas Gear, and so are the, all the others. I don't know who to believe, but, I, but they both they do make sense. What it could be is we don't know. There is an invocation that happens. However, Fortescue insists on in liturgy, all invocations, that means all epiclesis where we're calling on the Holy Ghost to come down, always happen after consecration. And there's, there's something that happens after consecration. There's some prayers there that seem a bit strange, and it seems like that's because that's where the epiclesis was. However, this had already, we'd already lost that by... Uh, before the first sacrament, uh, sacram sacramentary, uh, I don't know, the books where they had all the prayers in them, 
So in the early 300s, before the, or the late 300s when we had our first one, or early 400s when we had our first one, we don't even have any prayers in there for the epiclesis, this invocation. So we don't know in the Roman, this is how old things are. We just don't know. It's a humble thing to say, we just don't know. Could be that the Veni Sanctificator, uh, the Come Holy Spirit prayer was, is that prayer during the offertory? Could be that we don't have one. Again, I have no idea. Let me just finish this one quick part. If anybody has to leave, you won't offend me one bit. I understand you have to go. Um, the incensing of the altar. Now, the incensing of the altar, the only incense that we used before was we brought incense to the altar for... Incense was only used for procession in. Remember, we carried incense because it showed reverence and honor to the... It was an, it, a, a person that deserved to be honored. You carried incense before them, right? You weren't incensing them. It was just a people of honor had incense. So bishops started to carry incense and you started to do the... Pre you had incense when you're coming in. Then, because the gospel is really important, you had incense for the procession of the gospel. But because you had incense for the procession of the gospel, you started to incense the gospel. They didn't have the procession. They didn't have the incense for the procession to incense the gospel. They had it already because they were accompanying the gospel. But then when they're standing there, they're like, let's incense the gospel. <laughs> so they, this is how liturgy develops over time. So they started incensing the gospel. Same thing with the, uh, at the altar. You're in, you probably, they probably carried it in for, you know, at one point in time, and now they have it there, so now let's incense the altar. And so, well, let's incense the oblation, and let's incense the priest. And then they started to incense the deacon and everybody else. So it just started to, you started to realize, it just started to develop organically. It's not like somebody sat down and said, now the church is going to incense. It just, little by little, it all spread, and everybody was doing it that way. During this insensation prayer, there's a beautiful prayer that it says, the first one, it's through the intercession, when the priest blesses the incense, he says, by the intercession of blessed Michael the archangel, who, standing at the right hand of the altar of incense, interesting, in scripture in St. Luke, who's standing at the right hand of the altar of incense? Do you remember this? Zechariah. Who's Zechariah? The husband. She went in. He went in at the time of incense to offer. He was the priest that year. They had to offer the, the, the sacrifice of incense. And the angel Gabriel appeared to him where? Standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. So, but this is St. Michael. <laughs> Actually, in the 1705 or 1708 or something like that, many different people kept writing to the uh, congregation of the Holy Office at Rome saying, can we change this back to St. Gabriel? It's St. Gabriel. And they just firmly said, no, it's St. Michael. But in all honesty, St. Michael, when he appeared at Gargano, we just celebrated, it was written in, you know, Monte Gargano? That's where St. Pio's, um, you been there? No. That's where St. Pio is buried. He's on Monte Gargano. And then there's also the, the church not too far away from there. Actually, St. Pio used to say before to his spiritual children, before you come visit me, you have to visit St. Michael first. So whenever we would go there to visit St. Pio, because he was even, uh, they had him outside in the tomb. You could go up right and pray. We would go visit St. Michael first. You got to go all the way there. We'd walk this like back of the mountain. Then you got to go down every single step. It's a cave way down on the ground. You'd have to say glory be on every single step going all the way down into this cave. But that, that place was so holy that St. Michael told them, don't, don't bless the place. My presence has consecrated this building or the, the church. But when he appeared there, he appeared with a censer in his hand, they say. That place was so holy that when St. Francis went to visit there, there's a little spot at the very entrance of the church. He just knelt down there and prayed, and then he left. He's like, I'm not going in there. <laughs> it was too holy. He wasn't going to go into where St. Michael had been. So he just wanted to pray and then leave. But um, So St. Michael was, was put in there by the will of the church over time. But you'll find in different places in scriptures, it's St. Gabriel who's at the right hand of the altar of incense. Also in uh, Isaiah, when the coal comes to cleanse his lips, comes from the right side of the altar. Right? So that's why also in the, in the extraordinary form of the Mass, there's no incensation at the center of the altar. They started doing this in the ordinary form of the Mass because nobody knew probably why they were doing that. You, we always incense pro before at the right-hand side of the altar because that's where the angels do it at. You go to the right-hand side of the altar and you kneel down there, but it doesn't seem symmetric. But it's not symmetric. Why is he over there? Why does he go there? 
Well, it's just because it's scriptural. We just do it as scriptural. Um, and then as they incense the altar, these are things that got added in over time. That The priest makes you know, several signs of the cross over the oblation while saying beautiful words three times. And then he makes two loops, two circles around, and then one circle that goes around the other way while he's saying certain beautiful prayers. Genuflex, he makes you know, incensation of the cross. Then he genuflex, but he's not genuflecting to the cross. He's reverencing our Lord in the tabernacle. Though he's not incensing our Lord in the tabernacle, he adores him by genuflecting. When you say the right side of the altar, is it when we're looking at the altar? The right That's a good point. You know, if you were to read in a liturgical book, the Latin liturgical books written in the 1800s, they would say the left. And you get so confused, like, like when you incense something, everybody knows you incense the center, then you incense the left and the right. It says you incense the center, the right, and the left. But they mean the right of the book. Wait. So it's left. I can't figure it out. I don't know. But they, they have different ways liturgically of thinking about things. But you're right. When, when we say right of the altar, we mean staring at it on the right. So. And then there's another psalm. Psalm, um, the Psalm 140. While the priest is incensing the altar, he goes through and says this whole psalm, uh, incensing the altar. It's a beautiful psalm to be. Uh, at the washing of the hands, and the priest, of course, there's two lavabos in the Roman rite, and the one lavabo, the first lavabo is in the sacristy when he's vesting. The second lavabo is at this point. It's not only a sign of the washing, the purification of his heart, but also of his hands, because now he's going to handle this oblation that's going to become the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So he actually is washing his hands, but it's also a sign and symbol of the purification of his heart. So it has the dual ritual. In some rites, they had a, a double washing. So they would, wash their, uh, they would wash their hands before they started the offertory. Then they would wash their hands at the end of the offertory. Meaning, what they were going to gonna be handling the substance that's offered to God. Then they're going to be handling, handling the substance that's going to become God. All right, we're just going to have to leave it there. I don't know how we're going to go I'll try, to, I'll try to hit other points that are a bit more brief when we get to the last two classes because um, I can't really keep you in for any longer. So we'll start at the Rate Fratres uh, next week and we'll kind of push through some of that stuff. Any questions? Yeah? Mm -hmm. So how does that, I mean, I know that uh, the receiving... Uh, That's okay, I'll, I'll receiving, respond, I know what you're saying. Yeah, so, so the question is, the question is, when, when you receive, we're, 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 our Lord asked, tells us we have, to, we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood or there's no salvation in us. Well, Council of Trent resolves it and says that uh, in, in every particle there's a body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So if you receive a host, you receive the blood of Christ. You don't have to actually receive the, the consecrated wine that became the blood of Christ. His body, blood, soul, and divinity is in one little host. You can't separate the two. That there's a separation in as much as the, the, sacri the mystical sacrifice that happens. But when we receive one host, you receive the blood of Christ. So during the Mass, it is separated. It's separated only, but you can't separate Christ because he's living. It's symbolic. It's symbolic. But when you receive the host, you receive the full Christ. So not only do you receive his body and his blood, but his soul and his divinity. Now, the, 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 the consecrated wine for consumption is just dependent on what's going on. There was, there was one time where the, um, the Manichaeans were saying that you couldn't drink wine. It was bad. It wasn't Manichaeans. It was Albigensians. And I think it was Pope Innocent said... Everyone must receive under both kinds. Because they were saying you can't, you can't have wine, it's evil. So he said, well, let's root them out. Everybody must receive under both kinds. And then after that, there was uh, uh, times when they said, if, if you don't have the pressure, if you don't have the, the, the bread and the wine, then you haven't fully received. And then the church said, you may only receive under one kind. They had to weed this out of people. You know, you... 
Eucharistic heresies are very common. And now we live in a time where people are very ignorant on the Eucharist. Look at, there's, a, there's an increase in a, Eucharistic adoration and a decrease in what the Eucharist is. I've found that most people seem to think that Eucharistic adoration, you go there because our Lord radiates rays and the closer you get to him, they somehow penetrate you. It doesn't have to do with you adoring him. There's some, there's, there's different theological problems right now that are growing up from our ignorance and like in the Eucharist right now. But the church usually combats these in different ways. And so uh, right now the church is allowing us to have another both kinds. However, the interesting thing that's, that's coming up right now is people won't want to receive the Eucharist on the tongue because they're afraid of saliva from the priest's finger that might have touched somebody else, else's mouth. But they'll, re, they'll receive from a chalice that's full of spit. That's what I don't understand. The chalice will smell like spit, and they'll, they'll drink from that, but they're afraid that the priest might have saliva on his finger and give them a host on their tongue. They'll, they'll throw a fit. And you see this all the time now. It doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, it, yeah. No, 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 don't think of it that way. If they just received our Lord and they walk past, I don't, I don't genuflect to the tabernacle after I received our Lord. Why are you genuflecting to the tabernacle? You are a tabernacle. Why are you going to reverence the Lord when you're, you're, you're holding our Lord? It, it doesn't make any sense. So you got to remember, you don't have to walk past the chalice and make a deep reverence to the chalice. Don't disrespect the chalice, but be, you're, you're not focusing on the chalice because you're now a living tabernacle. So you're but focusing... I'm talking about not Okay, I don't even know why they're going up there then. You mean to get a blessing or something? They don't, I mean, I, I mean, I, it's just, it was hard for me to, to overcome that there is a Lord giving his blood right there. And people... No, no, that's what I'm saying. If you've received the host and you walk right past the chalice, you don't have to feel weird, weird about that. You don't have to reverence our Lord. Well, I mean, you're not, you're not, you don't have to go, you, you're a tabernacle walking past our Lord. Why do you have to stop now and bow to the chalice and keep going or genuflect to the chalice? Does that make sense? If somebody that only receives the host and then walks past the chalice, that's not a bad thing. Because they, they have the living God in them. There's no irreverence. Unless they have an intention to give irreverence. I'll talk to you about it afterwards because maybe we're just missing something with the explanation. But any other questions? So if you're getting on that topic, I just have a question. So what's this, what's in tinction? Where they dip the host in the... In tinction... Christ, what, what, where did that come from? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's actually... It's, a, it's an ingenious way to keep people from receiving in the hand, actually. It's very nice. It, it works. If you have a place where you can't not have... If you have to have communion in their hand or everything's going to go wrong, do in tinction. The only problem is, is when you have somebody come up, comes up who has to make an alcohol problem, even the smell of alcohol might set them off. And it's better to kind of try to know who these people are ahead of time, because if not, you're already in, you've already done the intinction, because you can't put that in somebody's hand. I think intinction works great if you have a communion in the hand problem, and you don't want to deal with it. And then you can also say, you know what, because we're doing intinction, it would just work out a lot better if you just kneel down because I just can't, I can't, get, it, I can't get it up there. Because there's, there's a difference in how you give communion You'll, you'll see a lot of priests give communion like this now with their fingers up. I mean, the index finger on the top. Um, and they have to give it this way. You're supposed to give communion with your fingers down and tucked away so out of the way. Your index finger's on the bottom, your thumb's on the top. So when you take the host, you can, you can do this right under the, on the, the tongue. What it does is it sticks the host right to their tongue and doesn't come off on you and you don't touch the tongue. So that what they were taught is exactly how to give communion and never touch somebody's tongue and never have the host come flying back out of the mouth and fall on the ground. Because it happens if you don't do it right. Doing it like this, you don't have as much control, and the, the, the thumb hits the tongue often, right? Here it's much thinner, and you're able to do this kind of, this Jedi move to, to be able to, to get in there. Right. But I shouldn't make fun that, that way, but I don't know how else to say it. You're doing this move. But um, anyways. So when did intention come about, though? Was that pre-Vatican do? Well, I think it's probably not Roman. It's probably something we get from other places because they would do intinction for, for, for different things. I'd have to look into it. I don't know much about I'm intinction. I think it probably comes from other rites, if I were to, if I were to guess. So.
Other questions? All right, I've kept you too long, so let's say a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, for all the God and Amen. Can we have your blessing, Father? Ecum Spiritu Tuo. Amen. Thank you, Father.